some of the super user secrets to entrepreneurial success. How many of you have been to a pseudo event in the past? Hands up. Great. And so how many of you are new? How many of you cannot count? It looks like we got that about right. That's great. <laughs> uh, how many of you consider yourself entrepreneurs already? You're actually doing startup or something? Fantastic, actually. How many of you would like to be an entrepreneur? Start a company. Okay, and how many of you are just here because of the free food and the booze? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's not the reason you're here. All right, well, thank you very much. We've got two uh, great panelists tonight, both serial entrepreneurs, believe it or not. <laughs> At, I mean, given how young both of my panelists are, um, repeat offenders, as we say. Uh, Melanie Perkins, the CEO of Canva, on my immediate left, and Hugh Geiger, the CEO of Ola Mobile. So I'm going to have uh, both the panelists introduce themselves because they can do a much better job than I can. I guess for those of you who don't know me, I'm the engineering director for Google Australia, and I'm based here in Sydney. Um, and we're very happy to have you. We want to keep this um, want to keep this fun and informative. So I'll I'll basically uh, lead off with about 10 minutes worth of questions. And then hopefully by then you have lots and lots of interesting questions for our panelists this evening. So. Melanie, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. When I, so I'm starting my second company at the moment, and when I started, I knew absolutely nothing about business at all. I didn't know what a startup even was, let alone how to raise funding or how to manage engineers or how to write software specifications. But what I did know was that we had a big problem that we really wanted to solve. It was something, I was at university, I was 19, and I was um, teaching people how to use design programs like Photoshop and InDesign. It would take a whole semester for the students just to learn the very basics. And at the same time, Facebook was taking off, and that was really fun and collaborative. And so I realized that in the future, design would be entirely different. It would be online, and it would be really simple. And so as uni students, me and my business partner, Cliff, we had um, no money. And so what we had to do was apply that concept to the niche market of school yearbooks. And that was where my first company was born. So we had the idea of an online design system applied to the niche market and built the first company, Fusion Books. We had a lot of hurdles and all sorts of ups and downs as you do when you're starting a company. And then, um, but we realized that that technology that we developed was much more powerful than just the yearbook market. We'd become the largest yearbook company in Australia. We had launched in France and New Zealand last year, but we really wanted to take it to a much bigger market, the mass consumer market. And so that's where Canva, my new company, um, was really born and so been through all sorts of journeys now with Canva as we've been raising investment from some really great investors in Silicon Valley. We revised our pitch deck hundreds of times literally and we've managed to get together a really great group of engineers, a great marketing and um, some just really exceptional team and um, investors and now we're just getting ready to launch our product in the coming month which is quite exciting. Um, so that's, I guess. When I come the, back to that, you know, when is the right time to launch? Yeah. Because tonight's theme is launching and, and basically how do you know when it's time to launch mm -hmm. and, and uh, managing launches and going beyond the launch phase. Thank you for that, Melanie. Thank Hugh? You. Uh, hi, so my name's Hugh Geiger. Um, I'm involved in Olo Mobile. This is my third startup. Um, my first was back in 2003. It was a, uh, I guess, something like what Yelp is today. We, we, um, we came out of school and I was working at Telstra doing customer analytics and I uh, thought small business could use some analytics. So we started looking at how to create a platform that was uh, I guess motivating for the customer and, and for, the, for the business to try and pay both for their, for their effort. Um, that went on for a number of years uh, and it didn't end very well. Um, I was uh, a little bit scarred by that experience and spent the next seven years learning how to develop software and run projects because it, it really upset me quite a lot the way that went. We, uh, we got the local Chamber of Commerce on board, we signed up several hundred businesses and we could never actually get the software to a point where I was happy to sell it. So our first experience was we got the money, we, we just couldn't deliver the product. So uh, that, was, that, was, that was the first one. Um, I then got involved in a cloud business where we uh, set up a, a, a cloud hosting business in about 2006, 2007. Um, I opted out of that one because I didn't see myself going head to head with Amazon and, and, and others. So uh, it was a lovely idea but it uh, wasn't really for me. Um, and now with Follow Mobile, we actually had a, a member of my family uh, experienced a fall and fractured a hip in the shower. Um, and that got me looking in the uh, aged care telecommunications space. And, and we're very unhappy with the quality of communication that was available, particularly to senior citizens and, and those that are of advanced age. Um, and so with Olo, what we've done is we've created a, a matchbox sized phone that pretty much has all of the smarts that your, your, your typical you know, Samsung or Apple smartphone will have in it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a cloud-based phone. So most of the smarts of the phone are actually pushed into the cloud. Uh, and for the wearer, all they have is a very small device, a very long battery life, that they press the button, 
They can say who they want to talk to, so call mum, call dad, you know, call my, my, my brother, call a taxi. Um, and if they do get into trouble, it's got ball and, and motion detection, which automatically helps them resolve that, 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 uh, that, that problem. So uh, we're, we're looking to position that as a, um, as a subscription service. We're not really big on the hardware game. It's, you know, uh, hardware has kind of come and gone, I think. We're at a commodity place now. So um, we've been working on that now for 20 months, and um, we've uh, been talking to people here in Australia and, and uh, around the world about that. Great. Well, I'd like to open it up by asking each of you, what's been your biggest challenge so far in basically just getting started, starting your, your company? There's been hurdles constantly throughout the journey and at different stages you have different hurdles. When we started out we had no money so we had to find a loan and then we had no software experience so we had to learn how to write specifications and how to work with software engineers and at the start we are outsourcing that and now we've got our own engineers. And eight, raising funds we didn't even know what venture capital was so we had to learn. But I think one of the, the biggest challenges back in 2010, the basic premise of the online design system for yearbooks was that people would design something online, the whole school would log in and create their profile pages and their photo pages and their article pages and that would get printed to a PDF and then that PDF would get printed into a physical yearbook. But in 2010 we decided that we were going to outsource our engineering overseas and to a software development company which was a not really a great idea but we thought we'd save some Tell money. Tell us how that went. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we, Slight digression. Yeah, we, um, it didn't go very well. We, um, it didn't, the basic premise of the going from the PDF into a, uh, going from online to a PDF actually wasn't happening. So we had 160 schools to create their yearbooks, um, 100 pages each, and that wasn't working at all. So we had to download every single photo from the yearbooks and recreate these pages offline in InDesign, <laughs> Adobe InDesign. And it was just the most traumatically <laughs> uh, time-consuming experience because we had to hire staff. We were in my mum's living room. We had printing presses going. So we'd get four hours sleep a night for three months. Um, and we'd have to change the printing presses every two hours. It was just this chaotically crazy thing. But we actually assembled all these yearbooks. And by the end of it, we delivered the yearbooks to the schools. The schools were happy and we had repeat clients from it. So um, that was definitely a very challenging year. <laughs> Certainly sounds like it was. Hugh, your biggest challenge so far? Um, I guess our biggest challenge has been uh, understanding what investors want to hear from us um, because we are in a hardware is not a very attractive space and um, how we shape that message has been a, uh, uh, a very challenging thing. So it started out with doors being slammed in our, well, actually doors not even being opened. So, you know, they can't be slammed unless I open it first, I guess. Um, uh, and then, uh, then we've, we sort of started to refine the message a little bit and then actually what we, we got so involved in trying to communicate with with the, the professional market that we stopped product development. You know, all our resources were going into just trying to push this idea and, and uh, it, we realized that we weren't actually going forward as a business. We were, we were really spinning our wheels and so um, it, it took a while for us to realize that we needed to step back and focus on, on, on our customers and our business and let the other side of things sort of take care of itself uh, to some extent. So, yeah. I'd like to explore now, you know, how you know when, when, when is the right time to launch? When are you ready to launch? I mean, Canva, you're kind of in a private beta pre-launch phase right now. Hugh, you're essentially relaunching, you mentioned. Uh, when, when do you know, you know it's, you're, you're ready to launch? I think, so right at the start, we had a problem that we wanted to solve. And as soon as you're solving that problem, you're ready to launch. And so that doesn't mean you need to heap in the features. You just need to solve that problem in a really real way. Mm. And it needs to be the people that you're trying to solve that problem for, it needs to be solved. And so at the moment, we're doing a lot of user testing. We use a really great site called usertesting.com. And you actually see someone log in for the first time. They've never heard about your product. Use your product. And you actually watch the interactions and hear their voice and watch a video of them using it. And so that has been just such a fantastic Your experience. users are OK with it. <laughs> oh, these are the users that actually sign up to go oh, yeah. and use this, this um, site. And so you got, get to see them experience the whole thing. And with us, like, it's an extremely complex system. We're having to build a lot of different components that have never been assembled before. And so during this process, it's really important that within the first five minutes of someone using it, they understand and grasp that concept. And like, there's this thing called Net Promoter Score, which you probably know about, which um, the average in, on usertesting.com for people to promote 
a product is like 23% giving a score of 9 or 10 to recommend it to a friend. And we've been getting like 88% of people recommending it to a friend, which has been really exciting that this incredibly complex system. That's actually system, off the charts, by the yeah. way. So. <laughs> <laughs> this incredibly complex system for people that are just randomly selected from the general population are ecstatic about our software within 10 minutes of, and they can understand it and use this very normally complex design system which I used to teach at, at university. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Hugh, so um, tell us a little bit about kind of, you know, how you've decided when to launch or when not to launch and when to relaunch. Uh, okay, well I guess um, uh, our, our question of launching is actually around we have some fixed capital costs and certification that we have to get through before we can deploy. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the testing and, and usability stuff that we've done has actually been on a fairly private one-on-one -on -one basis, leaving the device with people and letting them play with it and, and looking at usage patterns around that. Um, about when to launch, I would say launch sooner. Um, Paul Graham actually has a great essay article, whatever he does, uh, up at the moment if you guys are interested. It kind of covers this. I read it yesterday and went, wow, I nailed it. Um, but get out sooner and, and don't strive for perfection um, because you'll probably find that once people start using it that it's, um, it's, it's really not what you thought it was going to be. I mean, we started out in aged care and We've now developed a lot of the cooler stuff that is going to be really good in aged care was, came about because parents were coming to us and saying, hey, can I do this for my child? Um, so things that we didn't think were important actually turned out to be more important and things that we thought were really cool, not really important. So um, get user involvement in some way, um, clean user involvement so those that aren't your friends and don't really know you and don't really have a, a personal attachment to you, if you can do that sooner rather than later um, and try and uh, take that feedback with an open mind. Um, don't take it blindly, but um, try and balance that whole it's your baby um, versus you know then you and they don't really know your space as well as you do perhaps. So yeah. So we're hearing basically um, you know launch early and, and, and basically as soon as possible get um, uh, get user feedback, um, iterate on based on that feedback um, metrics. Be be diligent about collecting. Uh, metrics about how users are using your products. And, and, and I guess the sooner you iterate, the, the less work it is. You know, like if, if you build this huge pile of stuff and you need to iterate on, on top of that software stack, you've now got you know, exponentially more work than what you would have had if you'd just done it a bit sooner. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, so just stepping back just a little bit, I mean, look, a lot of people have uh, great ideas and uh, you, know, you, you, you probably have ideas every day and I'm sure a lot of people you know have ideas every day. Um, how do you kind of, <laughs> how do you manage this gigantic transformation from these ideas into things that you actually think you can turn into products and do you actually I mean is this uh, is this something you've actually actively thought much about or I mean I'm just kind of curious about the you know from the from the idea phase and kind of validating that idea into actually okay this is something we can prototype this is something we can build I think so as I was mentioning before we knew nothing about business or anything but what we had was a, a really big problem that we believe needed to be solved and as soon as you feel passionate and motivated and actually have spoken to a few other people and they feel a little bit passionate about the problem, that's, that's probably enough. We didn't know anything and we learned everything just in time as we went along. But I think have, the problem that you choose to solve needs to be one that is worth solving. And once you've decided that, then everything else can be learned along the way. And validating early that it is a problem that's worth solving. Exactly. It's really users and your, or your early customers. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think um, what, what Melanie said there comes down to passion. If it's something that it's that, that that you're passionate about, don't try and be passionate about someone else's problem. Um, I think that's a kind of a fairly fraught road. So it's something that you want to get out of bed to fix for yourself. Um, trying to anticipate what somebody else might think is a great idea um, or something that someone else might be passionate about. I've seen that quite a lot in the startup space where they go, these kinds of people have this I this problem, and I'm really passionate about fixing their problem. Um, try and find your problem because you're, you're going to have a better sense for what it is. Um, so uh, yeah, that's probably what I'll say on that front. Okay, well, I've got some I've, I've got some uh, questions about uh, capital uh, which I'd like to bring up, but I want to hold those for a minute because I'd like to ask the audience if there are any questions that relate to this kind of how do you you know basically launch concept to launch and um, basically uh, that that process. So is there anyone who's got any questions relating to this particular topic? Don't and Please uh, don't be shy. Just put your hand up, and we'll get a mic to you. We've got a question right here at the front. Right, uh, Melanie, and you. How did you start? Where did you start? Do you remember the first person you spoke to about financing? 
So we certainly didn't start with financing. Um, we had actually, um, the first thing we did actually was come up with the concept. We scribbled out what we'd planned on building this amazing system. Then we went and spoke to, every, I'm from Perth, and we went and spoke to every single software development company we could, and most people told us we were completely crazy. And they said <laughs> that we needed artificial intelligence and that it was pretty much impossible to build. And then we found one company that said they would build it. Oh, we found two companies. One said it was going to cost us a quarter of a million, which we didn't have. And the other one said they would do it for 55 grand. And so we were like, okay, that's awesome, but we don't have 55 grand. And so we had to, <laughs> to go and find 55 grand, which we were very fortunate to be able to put together from some family and friends. Um, and so that was really how the road started. And then actually handing over that money was the scariest thing of our lives because it was like buying a ticket on a roller coaster that you cannot get off. And I've been on for five years, but it's a really fun roller coaster. Um, so I think that everything just steamrolls once you've decided that you really want to attack a problem, then you just everything happens along the path. And that first 55,000, it was like friends and family. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, my experience with my first startup um, labored my perception of raising money. Um, we, we got money from a a local business person who was not really familiar with startups, not familiar with our tech, they were just being particularly affected by, by the problem we were solving. Um, so they said, hey, take some money. And we were, you know, 20 and we went, wow, that's great. We'll, we'll take the money. Um, and this particular person became a bit of a boat anchor for us. Um, it was a very, it was great when things were good, but it was horrible when things were bad. And once the money was spent, this person couldn't really add value to our business. If anything, he was just a, a problem. So um, I came into this, uh, this time around with Olo Mobile thinking that, uh, you know, how can we do this without anybody else's money? We just do it ourselves. Um, and uh, it, it was probably about 12 months in before I really conceded that actually we do need outside capital. But, um, yeah, I would say if you can avoid external money, um, absolutely. Um, and if you do need to raise, um, make sure that there's something more that that person can add once that money's been spent because it will get spent. And, um, you know, you, you want to be able to have someone you can have a, you know, wasn't a good day conversation with. So. Um, that's that's sort of yeah. Well, but what was the tipping point from uh, the realization that um, you know the original you know bootstrap approach, where it might have been friends and family, it might have been your own credit card or three credit cards maxed out. At some point, you know, you realize mm, we actually could benefit from external capital. So you've got yeah. venture capital now, right? Yeah. And you you talked about maybe doing uh, some crowdfunding. So somewhere along the line, you realize you needed more capital. So what you know what was the tipping point? So for our first company, Fusion Books, we raised we have growing that entirely organically. So we had no external financing other than that initial money. I think we got a 20 grand loan from the bank at some point to pull us through one year. Um, and so every year we've got the profits and reinvested that back into the company and grown. So it's been quite um, an organic process and we've learned every year and reinvested it. And it's been wonderful because we've had no outside shareholders. We've been able to make mistakes, make decisions and really learn a lot along the way. But we, to attack this new market, which is Canva, we really needed a lot more um, financing behind us. And so it was a, a long process of, I spent six months in Silicon Valley over the last two years. Um, we, it was wonderful to get absolutely smashed and hammered by investors, well, which the, the first time we pitched, we just got so much criticism that <laughs> it really helped us to refine what this we were doing. This is important to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to love you the first time they hear your pitch. In fact, they're probably going to hate it. Yes. So you yeah. develop a thick skin. Absolutely. Still, still smiling, though. <laughs> <laughs> but the, getting hammered by investors is such a fantastic thing because it really helps you to refine your strategy and to be able to articulate your idea. We'd had this idea for five years at this point in time. We'd built a company, we'd built a product, we'd got lots of clients, made the company profitable. But getting questions from investors really helps you to put that into a cohesive strategy. So what we did, we um, took every question that we got and we put it back into our pitch deck. So by the end, we'd done 100 revisions, but we were answering all the questions before they were even asked, um, which was a very interesting process of reiterating our pitch deck. That's a nice place to be. So Hugh, you've also kind of made this you know, tipping point, I guess. And yeah, recently. yeah. We just had some significant. So we, we prototyped ourselves. So we've, we've developed a working prototype and, and we had a similar experience where we went, OK, well, how's, how much is it going to cost to make a mobile phone? Uh, I don't know how much. So there is a saying the obvious. Uh, there's a difference here. Hugh's developing hardware. And so you know, there are some costs associated with that. Yeah, things we can't avoid. So we, we, we're developing a software app. We've got a, a cloud telephony platform. Well. Uh, and, and we're also doing a physical mobile phone. Um, 
So when we went to market and we said, oh, how much does it cost to make a mobile phone? We had, we had uh, a, a UK company that sounded fantastic. They had ex Motorola engineers, so sent us a little invoice saying, oh, it'll, it'll cost us approximately $1.2 million to, to, to build this, but no worries, it'll be easy. I uh, we went, wow, that's, that's lovely. We'll pop that one in the drawer. And then, then we had uh, uh, another guy uh, from a, you know, an outsourcing company, uh, won't say from where, but overseas. And they said, oh, we can, we can do this for $4,500. It's no, no trouble. We can, do, we can do that too. And so we went, well, if we just collect enough of these quotes, eventually we'll know roughly how much it's going to cost. But it didn't. Like the, the, the quote spread was just right across. And so we, uh, we just decided to start ordering parts offline and teach ourselves to be electrical engineers and start you know, wiring it all together. Uh, and then we did work with a, a local Sydney firm to uh, to do the final, you know, the, the the boards and create the boards and to drop the stuff on for the first prototype. Um, but our, our, what we had, the advice we'd received at that point and the perception that we had from some very helpful people was that just make your prototype, and once you've done that, go and go and raise funds. It, it all seemed very easy at the, at the early stage. Just make your prototype, and then people start throwing money at you. And and uh, of course, it's not like that at all. Um, it's a lovely idea, but. Uh, uh, yeah, so on the, on the topic of criticism, I think some of the best feedback you can get from people um, is, is criticism. Um, those those in, uh, business professionals that go out of their way to tell you that they don't agree with your concept, you don't have to agree with them, but um, it's a very generous thing that they're going out of their way. The, the less generous way and the most common thing you'll get is just a smiling nod and a, that's a lovely idea and then they don't return your emails. So um, it's, I would say find people that are critical and just keep hitting those people um, because they'll get either less critical over time or You'll actually grow as a, you know, in terms of your understanding of the business. So, uh, your criticism is, is good. Um. So let's take some more questions. So there was some hands up over there. Yep. Uh, yeah. get, let's get a mic. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I think uh, most entrepreneurs would love to sort of uh, play around with their idea. You know, screw up a few times and fix it up, and you know, treat it like their own little baby, right? The only issue is that in that sort of market, there's a lot of big guns who obviously can't have the money um, backing them up to innovate and grow, whereas an entrepreneur may, when there's, because you said start up as soon as possible, right? So I think the only issue that I personally am facing is that um, with less money backing me up, there's less room to innovate and grow and be a step ahead of the competitors or potential competitors. So what did you or, or you uh, specifically do to strategize and stay one step ahead? Um, well, I guess uh, in, in the context of what we're doing, um, our, our industry looks at what, what these uh, the senior citizens need. And they say what, what these people want is a medical solution. Um, what we think they actually want is, is, a, is, a, is a social communication tool that brings them closer to their family. They, they don't really want to have a, a, you know, a stranger in a call center saying, hey, are you feeling okay? They, they want to talk to their son or their daughter or their uncle. Um, so we're, we're looking at, at positioning differently and we know that our competitors can't really go into that space because it clashes with the rest of their product portfolio. So for them, it's, they can't go there or they don't want to go there and if they do go there, it'll look inauthentic. So um, in that respect, I, I would say that that's, you know, go somewhere where they can't. Um, if, if it's just a matter of money that, that you know, your competitors can beat you because it's more money, then I would say that you, you, know, you maybe need to look at your strategy and then consider a different approach. Um, big companies innovate pretty slowly though, so um, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about big companies. I'd probably be more concerned about hungry startups that are perhaps better funded because they started in a different postcode. Um, so, yeah. Or zip code as a case Or zip code as a case may be, yeah. Yeah, I think there's really two aspects for us, um, go niche before you go wide. Solve one person's problem really well because I think big companies, that's something that they, yearbook, a yearbook market isn't that exciting for Adobe or for a, you know, a different, different larger companies aren't really going to want to focus on one particular customer. They want to have a big market. So if you've got a really big idea, which is what we had at the start, you can't pull that off when you're just starting out but you can pull it off for one user. If one user or one little segment really cares about your product and you really solve it well, that's really important. Um, and so that's absolutely what we did with yearbooks and then now we're taking it to the wider market. The other thing is I think it's the most <coughs> unproductive thing to do to worry about your competitors. It's really demotivating. It's really, um, it gets feature for feature if you start looking at your competitors and what they're doing. What, in our company, we're always thinking about our own path. We know this is where we are and this is where we want to go and these are the steps that we have to get there. And everything else is completely irrelevant. 
we know where what we think the future of design is going to look like and then every day we work towards that and it's completely irrelevant if another company comes and does something somewhat similar we're very fortunate at the moment that we don't believe anyone else in the world is doing something similar but I think it's really dangerous to think about your competitors and actually think that what they're doing has any relevance to what you're doing actually because there's certainly in every other industry there's more than one comp competitor in the market um, and you're very fortunate if you are the only people in the world doing that. Some people say that having competitors in the market is a sign that it is an interesting market to be in. Yes, um, they'll say, oh, the market has been validated. Exactly. Well, oh, it must be good, you've got 10 competitors. Mm. So, yeah, I would definitely not give any consideration to what other people are doing, as long as you're solving. I agree uh, with not fixating on competitors, totally yep. agree. Investors, however, uh, and I'll declare I'm an angel investor, will obviously ask you the questions. So give it at least enough thought to answer those questions. Absolutely. And obviously don't fix that. That was actually, so <laughs> when I was saying we were reiterating on our pitch deck, so at the end of our pitch deck, people would say, well, what about this company that has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing? <laughs> and we'd say, what, and so what we actually did now, like I think the third slide in our pitch deck became a competitive landscape slide. So we show where all the other companies are in the market and then where we're filling this huge gap. And so that was a great way to put angel yeah. investors' minds at ease. Nip that in the bud. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's take some more questions. I, I saw quite a few hands. So I, how, how about up here? Hi, this is this one. <laughs> okay, just for Melanie, uh, two quick questions. The, the 50 grand, when you got it from friends and family, how did you go about the practicalities? Was that just a, here's a gift, go for it? Or, or was there formal structure? The second question, did you want to get the 50 grand for critical mass to get some product out then to go fishing for more capital or was it the 50 grand let's see how this thing goes? Um, so the first question it was very informal um, we had I think we may have like penned like physically with a pen and paper <laughs> a contract um, and then because they were close family and friends um, and then the second was we, so we got $55,000 and that was really important because the $5,000 was the GST and we got that back because we were not profitable and so that became our marketing budget. We didn't know anything about, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know anything about venture capital um, so it was not at all even on the path that we were going to be raising money. So that 55 grand purely bought our software development and it was on a fixed um, fixed basis. We had a great software company that honoured it even though it ended up being a much bigger project than expected. And then that five grand became the marketing budget. We got 15, uh, 18 clients in our first year, so 18 schools were using it. And then we were able to get that profits and reinvest back so we actually had a marketing budget that was bigger for the second year. Over there, question on the right. A uh, question for Hugh. Um, you mentioned before about doors not being opened because you're dealing with hardware. Can you just sort of elaborate a bit on that? Is, is hardware unsexy or investors don't like it? What's going on there? Yeah, um, the, uh, I mean the, 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 the feedback that, or my, my personal experience um, has been that there's a very strong perception and it's probably the correct one that just about anything that you can throw onto a circuit board now can be thrown onto a circuit board by someone else. Um, Someone else who uh, can flood a market more quickly than you. So if your if your business is selling, um, you know, a better widget, um, speed to market is is absolutely critical. And if it does turn out that you know it was quite popular and you sell a hundred thousand units or something, um, th that you're going to attract the attention of someone else who's got more working capital and better access to retailers or whoever else, and that will work around you. So um, if you are looking at hardware, I would. Um, suggest that you look at uh, subscription models or models that tie a, a widget to, to, to a fundamental piece of software. Uh, and we're seeing that with, with smartphones now, like you know, Google Glass is, a, is, is an accessory for, a, for an Android phone, which is now, you know, the, the phones themselves are becoming commodities. Um, seeing Apple get into the same space where they're trying to build on what is now fundamentally a commodity. Um, so yeah, if you're in the hardware space, I would say look for recurring revenue and look for a way that you can lock out people with better network access and better retail access than you. That's great advice. Question up here. My question is more about after you launch, managing the scaling process. How painful was that? I think um, I was having a conversation with one of our engineers the other day and he was explaining how every power to the 10 is a huge new set of challenges. So when you go from 10 clients to 100 clients to a Etc. Um, and so 
I think that the most important thing, especially when you're starting, is to not worry, like you need to obviously have the correct infrastructure in place, but without being overly cautious and building for 10 years into the future. But if, I think delighting the one user and delighting 10 users and actually having their user experience being a really powerful um, and something that they want to share with other people is, is probably the most important aspect, especially at the starting stages. Uh, yeah, I, I can't really add too much to that. Um, I would say that if you, uh, when you do start engaging with customers, um, try and be respectful of their time and be uh, not too optimistic about your delivery timeline. Um, in the past, we've burned customers by going out too early and saying it's coming tomorrow and then have it not come and then contact them again and say, well, actually, actually it's next week. Uh, and then do that for six months. It's they, 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 they get sick of hearing from you. So yeah, timing is a, a, a critical consideration, I would say. It's good to be thinking about, I mean, even though you might be building your prototype and the, the launch may seem like some, you know, mythical date in the future, I think, you know, it's good to be thinking about at least the technologies that would enable you to scale. For example, you know, you talked about, you know, you, you're using the cloud as, you know, your subscription capability yep. and I'm sure Canva's using the cloud big time too. But it's all desktop based, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Shock horror. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously... Don't lock yourself into a set of technologies that would make it difficult to scale. But yeah, I guess the real secret to scaling is going to be getting users out there becoming, you know, advocates for your products. And it sounds like yeah, that's. I just plugged the Paul Graham article again too. It talks about starting uh, unscalable businesses yeah. and being unscalable from day one. Um, he seems to think that scalability is something you can build into. So. Throw into your shoes. We have a question. Hey, how's it going, Shai? Um, so we have a cool idea. You have no experience in developing it. You decide you don't want to outsource it to China or somewhere as you have had issues. What do you do? You have no money to bring in developers to pay them. Do you find someone and make it a co and make him a co founder? So and you're a non technical yeah, um, entrepreneur. Well, one who's one, one might be a non technical entrepreneur. Because there's a difference. Because if you are an engineer, in theory, mm -hmm. you know, you could implement your idea. So okay. just want to understand the question. Shai has no experience tech. Um, or programming whatsoever, has a cool idea, wants to make it, um, do you bring a developer on board and make him co-founding person, or do you just hire someone? What's your experience has been with that? Do you want to start with that, Speaking to other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. We've tried all of the above. So <laughs> we've um, outsourced in Australia, we've outsourced overseas, and then we spent a year trying to find engineers, and we eventually, after a year of literally searching, we found a great engineer. Um, each of them were really interesting for the different stages. So outsourcing to an Australian company, because I'd had no practice writing wireframes or anything, in fact, I thought at the start it was like the letter Y, it was like a year until I found out that it was wireframes. <laughs> um, it was really great to have that as a fixed price product because I think that at the start you're like wanting to throw in all these features, but because you have a limited budget and limited time, you're really forced to get that core product out. Um, so that was actually a really great way to start. And also, I don't think any engineers would have joined us, certainly not at the start. So I think anything to get the ball rolling, you do. And if that's outsourcing in Australia or outsourcing overseas, you need to make sure there are good quality coders. So you'd probably, even if you are outsourcing, make sure you get an engineering friend to go and check that the code is actually not spaghetti code, as our code was called <laughs> many times at the start. Um, now we're in a very fortunate position that we have really fantastic engineers We've Got a few Google guys, and, <laughs> <laughs> no and, <laughs> and um, so the, now the product we know is being built in a very, very proper way. It's it is scalable. It is going to be able to be, um, you know, hit by hopefully millions of people in the not too distant future, and survive hopefully Touchwood. We've got a few power of tens to get to before then. Um, but yeah, just do whatever you can to get started. And the further you get along, the more proof points you get, the easier it is to get engineers. And it was really hard finding a technical co-founder, especially a really great one. Um, so yeah, after a year of searching. I went to San Francisco. I went to every single hackathon, every single conference, every engineering conference that I could. I spoke at conferences, and no one wanted to join my team. <laughs> I actually was wondering whether Coming to events like this is helpful, too. Can I ask a question? How many, uh, how many of you in the audience uh, would you know, classify yourself as a, a non-technical uh, potential founder? There's quite a few of you. OK, so you should be networking like crazy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Pitching your ideas just like Melanie was. 
Q, was, did you have a technical capability in your team from the get-go, uh, or did you have to develop this one? This time we did, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, I've, I've done the, the circus as well, uh, <laughs> yeah, previously, where, yeah. where you go, oh, we'll, we'll go send it overseas, and then you get spaghetti code because you can't look under the hood and see what it really looks like. Exactly. Um, um, but yeah, I would say, as a, as a non-technical co-founder, your, your, probably your core responsibility is to be able to scope the project, so understand what it needs to deliver and what the minimum what the minimum shape of this thing should look like. Don't, don't, um, there's a tendency there to just want to hand it over to the engineer and go, well, you're good at building stuff. Just can you build this dream um, and, and just sort of toss it over the fence? That's a really dangerous place to be. And they'll often, particularly in the early days of the relationship, be like, this is great. We're going we're gonna to change the world. Um, but once you're about 12 weeks in and you haven't really gotten anywhere and uh, you're asking them to keep giving up their weekends and spare time, um, it does get old pretty quick. So. Um, as a non-technical person, you can wireframe it. There's going to be a human interface of some kind. You can own that and, and test that and understand that. You don't have to build you know, the, the big technical back end to understand whether or not this general concept is going to work. Is it fair to say, though, you do need to kind of uh, understand the language of your engineers I mean, so you can at least communicate yeah. with them? I think you can learn that, though. I think, you know, yeah, like it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can learn yeah, it, but, you, know, um, but you, need to, you need to get yeah, it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think I saw a question back there by the column. <coughs> Um, hi, hi, Melanie here. Um, just with the conversation around your team picking the features for your launching products, could you speak more about that? The, sorry, just to clarify the conversation <coughs> with team members around... Uh, around sort of what features you should put in your launching products and what shouldn't. You should leave it for a later date. Product management type right. stuff, yeah. Um, we, we just, I guess, um, by working really closely with our customers and um, potential resellers, we, we talk to them about what they want and how their business works or where their value is and just really focus on that. Like we've got some cool ideas about stuff that we'd like to do but that goes in a bucket. We've got this ideas bucket but you know, this is great. Off it goes. Um, just to try and keep it very focused on what we consider the minimum thing that someone will pay for um, or you know, whatever the value transaction needs to be. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it, the core thing is to solve the problem. And anything that's not solving the problem should, probably shouldn't be done before you start speaking to users. So it's sort of this, like, you've got the, the base product, which pay, your customers can't really tell you what to build. If we went and spoke to users at the start and were like, hey, what should we build? They'd probably say, like, a InDesign with a few more features. <laughs> and that would obviously be a bit crazy. Um, so that core product, to actually be able to communicate the vision, has to be built before you can really get valuable feedback from users. But as soon as you've built that, then they can help define the interface. Like we, um, people would, when we started user testing, our first thing, everything was about drag and drop. But we actually would find that some users wanted to double click on things and have it land on their page. And then, so now we have double click and drag. And just like the key tweaks like that is really important. So you have to build the product to solve the problem. But then as soon as you can, start speaking to users to help refine that interface. Question over there, all right. Run, Brett, run. We're on air. No dead time. <laughs> this might be a little out of context because I've been out and had to move the car and came back. But what do your investors want out of the companies? What are they looking for? What is the payback for them? <laughs> I, for us, um, the investors that invested believed in our vision and believed what we could actually build. So we would go and paint what we are planning on building over the next five, ten years, what the end goal is, then what our next steps are, the, the year goals, the two year goals. And so I think the investors that ended up investing in Canva believe in our vision of where we can take the company. Um, and I think that's really important because people that didn't believe in what we were doing actually works quite well. They didn't invest. <laughs> so um, I think the j investors that want to come on the journey and hopefully build a really big company um, with us is the ones that ended up investing. Yeah, I would agree. Shared vision. Um, if, if they share it or they don't, and uh, you know, if someone clearly doesn't get it, um, just move on. There's, there are other people, and uh, they're probably not the right person. The trick, of course, is finding the right investors who do share the vision. And I think when they sh investors that share the vision, in the back of their minds, they're thinking, well, this is a great idea. They're eventually going to be really, really successful, and I'm going to make some money too. So they, they correlate. But obviously, if you don't have the vision, you'll pass. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's take one over here. Yeah. Hi, this is for both Melanie and Hugh. Um, 
other than the vision and then agreeing with the vision, um, what else did uh, you have to demonstrate to the investors that you had? You know, did they want to see traction? Did they want to see 100 users, repetitive use by users, et cetera? Um, they want to see as much as you can possibly show them. So for us, we had Fusion Books as the benchmark to say, yes, the technology is possible. Yes, we can build something. Yes, we can get something to be profitable. We have an idea about managing companies and, and growing and all those sort of things. Um, and we, it, like the competitive landscape, there's, I don't know, 50 odd things that you need to prove and you need to get enough ticks in enough boxes to be able to get them to believe that you're not going to be a complete flop with the money and that you can actually build something of substance. Um, there's, so I, I'd say the key things are, um, I think the key thing is that they believe that you can actually build this new future. Well, that was what the plan is for us, that we have an idea of what we believe the world is going to look like in design um, in the future and they believe that we have ticked enough boxes to be able to get there. Yeah, um, our experience uh, has been mainly around traction. Um, demonstrate that someone's going to hand over some money for your product or you know, if it's not a direct sale product, that there's you know, people using it and it's sticky, I guess. But for us, it's been about traction and being in hardware, that's a catch-22. You know, we, we can't deliver our product um, without certain capital investment. We can't demonstrate traction without that. Um, we were asked initially to get some uh, you know, letters of intent and, and sign documents from various people saying, oh, we'd love to buy a bunch of these. Um, that turned out to be a little bit of a red herring. Um, you know, we, we had several million dollars in papered sales um, that didn't help. So um, that's why we're now sort of looking to, to crowdfunding because we can show end users paying for a product. Um, and um, yeah, so crowdfunding is, is our circuit breaker for the traction question. Yeah. I'd actually add, I'd add one more thing. Um, so the investors, we started building a relationship. I met the first investor. We had a five-minute conversation after a conference um, in 2010. And then every few months, I would send an email saying, these are our product milestones. These are our user milestones with Fusion Books, the first company. And so we're building a relationship over quite a substantial year's period of time and demonstrating the fact that we were succeeding when we said we were going to do something, we did it. And I think that's really paramount. You don't need to start having... Um, conversations with investors when you're wanting money. You need to start having them early on in the piece and you need to start proving that you can actually do what you say you're going to do. And I think that's probably one of the most powerful things. I've got, there was this um, uh, diagram published in Pando Daily that showed the network effect of all the investors that we met. So each investor, when you've actually won over an investor and they want to invest, they would introduce us to more investors. And so actually we didn't get any um, any investors that just sort of we met after a five-minute conversation, they didn't say, hey, here's a checkbook, um, <laughs> write your own check. Um, it was always like one investor after having known that person for a few years would then introduce us to more investors. And it was a very, um, it was a very slow process, of course, um, but being able to prove that you're achieving is, and doing what you say was paramount. That's, that's a good point because it's worth noting that investors like to co-invest with people that they're familiar with too. So it does it does not only you know it takes mm. some of the risk out of it too. You can share the uh, you can share the uh, the diligence. That's why um, angel investors kind of come together as to form syndicates, and that's why you know venture capitalists will share the diligence too. Let's take a question from the back by Brett. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm doing an MBA at AGSM. First of all, thank you, Melanie and Hugh, for sharing your experiences with us. My question is for both of you. What do you think are the most common mistakes that people make during their first startup or things they should watch out for? A great question. That is a great question. <laughs> I think there are a lot of mistakes that you will inevitably make because you don't know, like well, in my situation, I knew absolutely nothing. So you have to learn it as you go. Um, that's obviously part and parcel. But I think one thing that you need to get right from the start is that you're solving a problem that is worth solving. And that means that, because eventually you will get, you know, if, you, if you're in the right spot, you will get users, you'll get products, you'll get engineers, and even if it's taken five years, as it has in our case, to get all these things together. Um, but if all in all, if you aren't working on something that's worth solving, it will make it very challenging to um, build on the people in the bandwagon if you're not headed in the right direction. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about making mistakes because you, you're going to make a lot. Just try and make them quickly. Um, uh, you know, don't very don't... sage advice. <laughs> yes. uh, and it is and learn from the mistakes. Uh, well, you know, uh, sometimes I guess. <laughs> um, the common ones I've seen are um, uh, yeah, outsourcing magic. So 
just saying, I've got this dream, can you someone else build it for me? Um, particularly looking at cheaper markets like uh, when you outsource to Elance or something like that. Um, you, you actually need to know a lot more about what you're doing to outsource to a third party than if you were just doing it yourself with a friend. So um, I see a lot of uh, particularly non-technical founders go, oh, okay, well, I don't really know how to do this, but it should just be a simple matter of throwing this together. Um, uh, so you'd be very wary of that. You really need to understand your product better than anybody else. Um, the other thing I see, I've seen uh, technical founders do quite a lot is um, just piling in the features, just having like really bad scope control and feature creep and saying, well, we're going to get this thing out. It's going to be minimum viable. And then two years later, they're still building. Um, and you know, it's, it's just a matter of being disciplined and focusing on what the core value is and really trying to get to that point. Um, and if you get it out and the customers don't like it, then consider that a learning curve and take that feedback and tweak it, um, but do it, do it quickly. So on the subject of mistakes or potential mistakes, I mean, what would you say about people and, and choosing you know, co-founders and, and your first employees or colleagues as the case may be? I mean, do you make mistakes uh, in those in the people area too, and how do, you, uh, how do you avoid those? Probably the first time around, yeah. The second time I've been a lot slower, I guess, to, to get a business partner. Um, you know, I'd, my, my current business partner, Ken, uh, Ken Mack, and he, he and I had known each other for a while. We'd actually worked on another project just as a, as a test to see if we can get along because, you know, it's, it's pretty important that you get along. Um, so I would say hire slowly, network really aggressively. If you need to find someone, get out and get to all these kinds of events. You're already doing great things by being here. Um, but go to all of them and, and meet as many people as you can. Um, get on LinkedIn and LinkedIn stalk people, Twitter stalk people. Um, you know, it's just just really plug in. Um, I, compared to San Francisco, Australians are really quiet. Like there's not, people really aren't sort of in the mix as much here. And I think that that's something that we could do better. Yeah. So. I want to come back to that because well, this is part of what we're trying to do, obviously. But yeah. Um, Melanie, people? Yeah, I think we've Boy. been really fortunate. Our staff have come from all sorts of bizarre places. We met one at a backpackers. I've had the same business partner for five years, and he's been absolutely exceptional to work with. We've got a new technical co-founder on for Canva. Um, it took a long time to find these amazing people. And so I think being really selective about who is coming into your team is absolutely paramount. But the people that have ended up being in the team have all you know, really shared the same vision. It's all been very um, intrinsically motivating, motivated people, which has been really important that people actually are working on it because they're passionate about what you're doing. Mm. Well, one other thing I, I picked up over in the States was um, have a uh, vesting that's a cliff. So you know, say, oh, you're my technical co-founder. You'll get half my company or, or whatever it is. Um, but on delivery of A, B, C, and D and over this period of time. Um, that way you don't get stuck in a situation where I know um, another Brisbane company had issues with um, certain members of the team no longer really wanting to participate but still having a, 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 an ownership stake in that business. So um, if, if you do meet someone and you don't know them very well, uh, have some sort of controls in place that allow you both to back out if it doesn't work. So just to clarify, any equity you issue in shares would vest over time, typically over four years, but um, you would put in place a, a one-year cliff, which means they have to be there, or and it could be tied to yep. a launch. Yep. One year is fairly common, but uh, yeah, just basically provide a little bit of insurance. Yep. I think we've all made you know mistakes where you know someone crucial left too soon, and, and then yeah, uh, you want to avoid that. There was another question back there. Yeah, yeah. question for Melanie and Hugh. You've both spoken a lot about um, you know, satisfying or delighting one user as opposed to sort of semi-satisfying a number of them. How do you deal with you know, a large user group and contradictory feedback? Who, you know, do you turn to quant or look at the, the qualitative stuff? What do you do? I think that anything that you implement in your product needs to be in line with where you want to take the product. So um, even in the, the, with the user testing we've been doing so far, we've had you know, hundreds of different suggestions of people wanting it in different ways. And so you need to make sure that anything that you're implementing is going in one direction. Otherwise, you'll end up building something like, no offense to InDesign, you'll end up building something like, like InDesign, <laughs> the, 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 which is great for the professional market that is very, um, wants to spend a lot of time learning very complex software. But the whole point of our software is that it's simple. And so it's really important that we stick to that vision and stick to the, the Anything that we're implementing is in line with that. So we listen to a lot of people, but then we, what we implement is very selective to make sure that it's in line with the, the path that we want to take. Yeah, I agree with, with that vision. Have your vision and, and um, have some confidence in it. Um, in terms of feedback, uh, I would, where possible, try and look at what people uh, are doing rather than what they're saying. Um, so 
you're laughing at people going, hey, I'd really love for it to do this, but if you're looking at the way they're using your system or your prototype or your platform, um, are they really wanting to do that? Um, or are they just thinking that you know an extra button is another great idea? Um, and then you add the extra button, they go, gee, I really don't like this extra button. Um, so you can waste a lot of effort, and you know when you've only got a small team, that that effort counts. And uh, yeah. Any more questions from over here? Oh, we have a question aboard. The right side is on a roll. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm just um, curious to know whether um, exit strategy still features in in VC. Uh, you know, when you when you're looking for for money, how important was it for you to have some idea of a, an articulation of of an exit strategy or a go big? Strategy and, and as a corollary to that, for Alan, how do you get Kevin Rose or Guy Kawasaki to come and knock on your door and acquire you? For me, um, our exit strategy really didn't come into question. It was about building something of value. Um, if you build something of value, like I'm pretty certain we're going to get um, offers from certain companies that Canva is very attractive to, but it's not of interest to us because we have this plan of where we want to take it. Um, right now, despite the fact we've been getting really resounding feedback on from user testing from each of the key demographics that we're targeting, um, we've only built like 1% of what we plan on building, and so we've got a, a big path and a big plan of where we want to take it. So exit wasn't even something that was really in conversation. If we build the product that is going to have the influence on the world that we hope it will have, um, it's not really, hopefully, a part of the question. Yeah, I kind of agree. There does seem to be a bit of um, focus in Australia on, you know, coming out and headlining with your exit strategy. But um, when we we're over in the states, we were specifically advised mm. not to talk about that. We we're told, you know, if, if you're talking exits already and you haven't started, um, you know, how committed to your business are you? Um, if, if you're doing something that is really great, um, there's always going to be someone who's big enough to acquire you. Or you know, if it's really great, maybe you know, one day you'll IPO or something. But I think uh, it's it's perhaps something that's over focused on here and um, not really useful. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I I agree with those comments, and I think um, it's but it is important as a, as a as a team of um, entrepreneurs to to know what you want. I mean, and it sounds like you're committed to growing your business, and that's the important thing. Um, yeah, I guess if I could uh, clarify on that point as well, it's uh, I guess uh, the the investors want to know that you're not married to your business, that you know that it's not. A personal piece of you that if the right offer comes along, you'll say, "Well, great, let's let's sell it to this person because that's an excellent offer." Um, you know, that it's not a lifestyle business, I guess, as as opposed to you know an asset that you're building on behalf of a team of people, and and you're looking to maximize the value of that asset. So, just a quick time check. How are we going, Sally? Not two more questions. Just see a hand go up down here. Well, I have a question. While we're waiting for questions from the audience, I mean, you often hear that. Um, you know, Australia doesn't quite have the same entrepreneurial culture of, say, Silicon Valley, and we've spent some time in Silicon Valley, so I think you know what I mean. I mean, how do you think we can really engender more of an entrepreneurial spirit or culture here in Australia? I think we're really starting to. Um, I think the venture capitalists like Blackbird, that was one of our investors that have come onto the scene, they've got this global focus, they've got connections with Silicon Valley. I think things like this is just fantastic. Like when we started a startup, as I mentioned before, we didn't know what a startup even was. And so I think that startups are something that actually happen naturally. Like when, you want to, when you've got a problem you've got to solve, that's a, that's a startup. We were one for a few years before knowing what it was. But all this, the media interest that's starting to really grow in Australia, um, all the different aspects that are really starting to, to flourish is absolutely very supportive. Having, when you're at school, being a, in a startup or an entrepreneur wasn't even something that I considered. And yeah, but you, you had your first uh, startup when you were 19 years old, yeah. Fusion Books, right? So yeah. something triggered in you, right? I'm yeah. just really curious. I mean, we'd like to replicate that. We'd like to have 1,000, 10,000, <laughs> no, 100,000. How do we do that? I think that, <laughs> well. Q, how do we do that? <laughs> So I'm serious. A clone clone button. Clone. Okay. Okay. We're going to clone our panelists. <laughs> um, uh, these kind of events are great. Um, we had Tyler Crowley in, in town a few months back, and he, was, he built, you know, he's contributed significantly to, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Los Angeles, their, their startup community. I think that's something he was known for doing. Um, it's just getting out and creating that critical mass on, on both sides. Though. Like it's a two-sided market. Like we, we see all these startups pitching two-sided markets, and the investors go, "Gee, how are you going to build the other side of that market?" But we've got the same problem here. You know, we've got a small pool of startups, a small pool of investors, um, and we just we, we need more entrants. We need more people from both sides of the equation getting in and being active. Um, I tend to lean towards perhaps some more seed funding to get people iterating quicker and to get uh, 
more students and other people into the game and failing quickly um, because the more of these failures we have, the more winners we're going to have and that will bring in you know, more money because everyone loves, loves to see a winner. Um, so I just think we need more churn in our space. I think we're, we're starting to get some momentum, but uh, there definitely needs to be a lot more churn. So, yeah. so I hope everyone in the audience is hearing that. Oh, we have a question back there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Opportunity to have the last question. Uh, basically, according to what I have seen from my friends, um, so here I'm quite curious to get an you know, answer from you that uh, during the, uh, when you first started your company, so at that stage, so have you, uh, between you and your co-founder or co-founders, have you guys put in place certain like formal or legal documents in terms of the shareholders, you know, rules, uh, require job scope, scope, and uh, later on the profits or, you know, the share, you know, those sort of documents have you ever uh, put into place? Um, for our first company, Fusion Books, we, um, me and my business partner, didn't have any documentation um, for the first. Oh, actually, I, I don't even know if we still do now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we do. We, um, but it was it, it was more about trust, and it was more about um, you don't have a job scope per se. I think the job of the founding team is to do every job that other people don't want to do. To um, <laughs> To put like there's a now we've got a, a a really great team and we've got a few different job roles. I feel like our job is now to be the jigsaw puzzle piece pe people that put the jigsaw together all the time. Um, so I don't think job scope is necessarily that important, but the um, now in Canva we absolutely do have all the document legal documentation, especially because we you know have vesting schedules as Alan was talking about for all our staff. Um, our team actually is probably more accurate. Um, so yeah, now we have the legal documentation, but and it, especially if you're um, starting to found a company with people you don't know, it's really important with the re, you know the vesting schedule and the cliffs and all that sort of thing. Um, but it depends, I guess, how well you know your co-founders. Q, would you like? Uh, yeah, look, I think the documentation is really important. Um, that you, it doesn't have to be hugely complicated, but just something that sets out the ground rules. Um, I agree about the the no job description, like if it's got to get done, it's got to get done. And uh, I think it might be unhelpful to draw artificial lines early on. Um, I mean, you're going to find out that your co-founder is better at and faster at doing something than you are, and then they'll just tend to do that work. But if they're unavailable, the work, you've got to do the work. So um, yeah, I, I, definitely the legal stuff. Um, deed of assignment as well. Make sure all the IP is going into the company. That's really important. Um, yeah, you want to make sure the, yeah. the company is getting the IP, not the individuals. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned yeah, that. So, mm. yeah. But yeah, the basics and obviously, you know, vesting agreements too. I mean, look, all companies at some point have to formalise uh, documentation because if not, I mean, investors will demand it. They, they want to know there's a certain amount of yeah. structure. But, um, you, know, at the, uh, you know, it will be underpinned by trust between the founders and the co-founders and the team too. So you've got to have both. I mean, documentation will not fix uh, a trust relationship that's not in place. So yeah. you've yeah. got to make sure the trust is there. I, oh, what's that, Brett? We have time. We have time for one more. Okay. I just have one question for Hugh. You said you came from an analytics background. I guess for a lot of budding entrepreneurs that kind of have an, a risk-averse mindset, they're always trying to gauge whether their idea is feasible. Was that was that your rationale for yeah. coming, coming, out, coming yeah. out from an analytics background? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big data nerd. Um, I, I, when I got into this, I didn't have a co-founder for probably the first four months because I wanted to validate certain go or no-go points in my business model. Um, so I took that upon myself to do that before I involved other people. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think being risk averse is healthy, especially once you um, once you start spending significant money on things. It's a good idea to think about maybe thinking think about it two or three times and having a good reason before you spend it because you know it's. Uh, Gets hard to get it back once it's gone. So. Having said that, you were also a currency trader once too. That doesn't strike me as particularly yeah. risk averse. Occupation. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I am actually quite risk averse. You know, I, I, but uh, I like big problems currency and, and I like big data. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's one of those things. If you aren't risk averse, you will lose your shirt and your house, and you know, like okay. it'll, it'll go pretty quick. Um, so yeah, that's Aussie uh, dollar buy sell. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think it's good to be risk averse. That's my view. Um, but uh, don't let it prevent you from taking action. Like, do your analysis, look at look at like your risk spread, and say, well, 
you know, we're here, I, I'm still okay, let's go forward. Um, risk aware. Yeah. I, I think risk averse might be a bit too strong. Risk averse suggests you perhaps are holding back. Be aware of the risks and measure the risks, understand the risks, quantify the risks, and but then... Yeah. But then Dive in, it still looks good. Yeah. yeah. We are out of time, but I have one more question I need to ask, and that's basically your top takeaway for the audience. One, If there's one thing you'd like to impart in the brains of the audience tonight, what would it be? The most important thing I think about starting a startup is absolutely determination. Absolutely everything else you will learn as you go along. Um, it's not important to have the plan and everything exactly, you know, knowing everything, what you have to do. If you know where you would like to go, even if it seems completely illogical that, you know, we're a university student and believe that we could change the world of design, we, you'll eventually fill the boots. And so just knowing that you, having enough self-confidence um, that you can persist and be determined and maybe it will take five years and it will, I'm, we're just at the start of our journey now. Um, just if you know where you want to go, eventually you'll get there by just taking one step at a time. So absolute determination, yeah? Yeah, um, I guess my throwaway line would be if you're feeling comfortable, you're probably not trying hard enough. Um, so get out there and if something feels uncomfortable, lean into it uh, and keep doing it until it doesn't feel comfortable, uh, until it does feel comfortable and then find something else to challenge yourself with. Um, uh, and, and network. Um, I see Australians don't tend to network Now that doesn't well. sound like someone who's risk averse to me, but uh, yeah, no, okay. <laughs> be I, uncomfortable. I, I, I hate public speaking, right? It's, it's horrible. Every great. time I get up to pitch, I'm, I'm you know, terrified. But uh, you know, that was, for me, something that's very difficult. I'm an introvert. So, um, but yeah, go out of your way to find stuff that, that, that you find difficult and, and, and lean into that if, 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 if that's pushing your business forward. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, thanking both Melanie and Hugh. Thank you. Thank you. And please network. Thank you so much, guys.